go ahead and get started here. Perfect. Thank you. So my name is uh, Jason Peterson with the uh, Woodstock Hemp Company. Um, give you kind of a, a brief rundown. I'm sure some of you guys have already been in my uh, sessions, but if you haven't, uh, my background is in uh, indoor uh, marijuana cultivation. Started on the medical side uh, a number of years ago with an indoor operation and uh, experiencing a lot of the same struggles and challenges that the hemp industry is experiencing right now. So, and those were primarily uh, oversupply and not enough demand. So what was happening was, you know, Oregon has like the highest concentration of just master cannabis growers in the entire United States. And as a result, we produce some of the best marijuana and hemp in the world. Um, it's an awesome, awesome uh, problem to have, except it is a huge problem because uh, of oversupply and because with uh, marijuana not being able to get shipped out of state, um, we just had a huge concentration of it here and ultimately prices crashed. Uh, so before that happened, I was already transitioning into hemp because I saw hemp as um, a new market, global market, um, and not not limited to just the state of Oregon. So I thought, great, here's an opportunity for me to take my cannabis experience, take it outdoors. I was kind of getting tired of working under the lights anyways, and uh, and actually closed down my indoor operation about two years ago. So no longer do anything on the medical marijuana side. But we're still we're seeing now the same problem that uh, the medical marijuana and the cannabis industry face, which is, again, oversupply and not enough demand. So CBD, brand new market. Um, there's not a lot of consumer information about out there, you know, um, from the medical side. I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal information, analogous information and hearsay, but there's not a lot of real hard proof evidence and research um, to inform the people about why CBD could help them or how it could help them. And until we get that, you know, unfortunately, the, the market is going to struggle as a whole. And so what's important and why I kind of do these sessions is to kind of give um, people who are in the industry kind of a, a, a real world view of how, you know, the different factors of, of, of farming and cultivation and growing um, affect the final product. And then also do some um, talking about, you know, the sale and processing of said product and how it's consumed and how it's used and so forth with the idea that, you know, the more information that you have, um, the better farmers you'll be and the better equipped you'll be to face some of the challenges that you're going to experience that I experienced in my numbers of years, you know, in, in indoor cultivation than also doing hemp. So uh, we've also got um, a Pradham Co-op today with us to talk about chemigation and fertilization strategies. Um, so I've been working with these guys, um, great group. They've, they've serviced the entire state of Oregon, um, but put together a lot of really hemp-centric um, centric fertilization programs um, for, for growers in the state. So they're going to be talking a little bit about that at, at the end. So. Uh, this session is about planting. So the previous session we talked about um, all your pre-planting needs, going through and building a budget, a timeline, um, sourcing your seeds, going through and doing all your field work, developing an irrigation strategy, and germinating your seeds. So now we're going to go into planting. So it's kind of assumed that that's already been done. Um, I kind of touched briefly here on you know sprouts versus seeds, when to plant, um, equipment machinery that you could use, auto flower versus photoperiodic plants. We don't really get into the difference of CBG or CBD just because they're pretty much the same plant, just a different um, cannabinoid oil profile. So, but effectively, you should be growing that exactly the same way. So. Go, go ahead and begin. So, you know, we've planned, we've prepped, and now we're ready to plant. So, um, for, you know, for most of you guys, this is like the first time you'll feel the actual crunch, uh, which is, you know, that kind of time where all that anxiety kind of builds up and you realize that you've got a deadline that you got to hit and you have to execute all these complex and important processes quickly and efficiently. And uh, as any farmer knows, like this feeling never goes away. But you know, as you do it, you know, year after year after year, you'll mitigate and that feeling will, will be lessened. So um, just understand you're going to feel a ton of anxiety probably at this point and worry and stress and lose sleep about any number of factors that could go wrong. Um, but hopefully if you guys have planned well enough and, and, and strategize that you'll minimize those as, as much as possible. So um, again, in this session, we'll talk about, you know, the different planting processes, the differences between direct seeding and planting sprouts, and then move on through the first couple months of growth, um, ending with uh, kind of the fertilization strategies and, and how that affects plant development. So. Um, so first and foremost, so planting sprouts versus seeds. So if you're going with sprouts, um, typically you're going to plant June 1. Um, that's kind of the standard around the 45th parallel. 
Uh, any sooner than that, if you're planting a photoperiodic plant, you do run the risk of it going into flower early. So, um, you know, the plant will be in a vegetative state, meaning it will grow in size and not flower uh, up until the light cycle gets very close to 12-12. Once it gets to 12-12, it will obviously flip into flower. So primarily in our state, that is done right at the end of July, August 1. Um, so it's important to make sure that you don't plant um, too close to that or too, too far away from that, that, May, uh, that May deadline, or June 1, excuse me. Um, Auto flower, completely different beast. You know, in some areas of the state, you can get two plantings in. Um, typically, you're looking at a you know 63 to 75 day period. Some are long as 93. So it's just understanding like your 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 auto flower genetic and what that flowering time is going to be. Um, but on the photoperiodic side, again, we try and get there right at that June one. It'll give us, in most instances, a plant that's you know five to seven feet tall for large scale um, agronomy, like any bigger than seven feet becomes incredibly difficult to mechanically harvest. You'll get stalks that are, you know, five, six inches in diameter and combines just really can't handle something like that, which is usually like the primary method of harvest. Um, if you use a bean picker, also again, like it just can't handle a plant that's much bigger than that. So for, you know, large scale um, agronomics, we're gonna try and keep plants around that five to six foot range. Still very big, plenty of, plenty of size to put on that, you know, one and a half pounds per plant, but small enough that any sort of machine can still handle the, the size and the strength because those stocks are huge and you know if you've seen it go into the combine like i've had a combine get bound up where like the rotor itself actually get bound because the hemp um strips have actually formed almost like a hemp rope inside the combine i mean and if you can imagine like that thing is i mean if you've ever been, been around one and they're on and you see that rotor spinning um i mean it's devastating and to actually have it get bound up by by a hemp rope that just formed from these pieces that were just spinning around is pretty impressive uh needless to say it's a pain in the ass to get in there and have to try and clean that out, uh, especially at 10 o'clock at night. But, um, you know, you do what you got to do. So planting, planting sprouts, uh, mechanical transplanters are, are great. Um, most of the time they're going to be manned. You can get like a one row or a three row transplanter. Um, typically you can plant 20 acres a day with a three row transplanter and a crew of nine people. That's that like full bore going all out. Um, probably never going to get that number. You know, most instances you may be able to get like 10. I mean, whatever anyone tells you their thing is going to do, like you can assume that it's going to be, you're going to be able to get half of that production out of it. Whether it's a dryer or a combine or a transplant or no matter what. So just factor, like if you've never used them before and you're not an expert with it, if they say they can get 20 acres a day, you'll get 10. So um, again, three row transplanters work great. You've got six people on the back each one manning, manning a row. So one person planting the left hand, one person planting with their right hand. And then you've got a one or two people behind, walking behind the tractor to make sure that your sprouts are getting seeded in properly. So what these transplanters do is puncture a hole through the plastic and they'll drop some, spray some water inside the hole, create like a little mud slurry. And then the um, laborers will go ahead and put that plant down in that hole. Um, they've got to put it down really low. Otherwise, what will happen is it'll float up to the top and it won't seat in properly and that plant will just die. So that's why it's important to have people walking behind your transplanters to make sure that those plants are getting seeded in properly. If you notice that they're not and that you're floating a lot of plants, you need to have your transplanters slow down. So it shouldn't be going any, any faster than probably one, one and a half miles per hour if you're doing a mechanical transplanter. Um, and that's going to ensure you're going to get the, the highest success rate on your transplanting of your sprouts. If you guys are doing um, direct seeding, I uh, had some experience with that last year in Central Oregon with a uh, pivot system. Um, worked really well. Um, what you want to make sure you do is, you know, water your soil really, really well. Make sure it's fully charged. And what charged means is that you've just soaked it. Um, so you want to soak your beds or your or your surf soil surface uh, half inch depth if you're going to go direct seeding, um, and then what you're going to notice is probably an 80 to 85% germination rate, about 10 to 15% lower than what you would see if you were to do like a sprout. Um, but you can usually with a direct seeder, you can do up to 50 acres a day. So the trade-off being like you can plant significantly more acres faster with less people. So can, one person in the tractor can plant 50 acres a day with a direct seeder versus nine laborers and, and 10 acres a day with a, with a three-row transplanter. Nice thing about doing direct seeding as well, if you're doing it under pivot, is you can plant in a grid pattern, so like a four by four, which allows you to cultivate um, for weeds in both directions. So if you imagine having uh, offset spacing, and if, if you didn't have rows, if you were just flat, you wouldn't be able to go, you wouldn't be able to go both directions with your tractor to do weeding because you would just start running over plants. But if you do direct seeding, 
in a pivot and a flat surface, you can do a four by four grid pattern and cultivate both ways. So it's gonna greatly enhance your ability to go through and weed uh, your rows. Um, so going through and plant spacing is what we talk about. So if you're doing June one, you should be probably doing, most people are gonna do a six foot uh, offset, six foot rows and four foot spacing between each plant. That's gonna allow for 1,850 plants per acre and it's gonna allow you to get that 2,000 pounds per acre is kind of the minimum that we kind of wanna achieve when we're going for you know hemp cultivation. So always wanna try and get 2,000 pounds an acre at a minimum and try and get 10% uh, CBD is always the goal. Uh, as you start planting later, if you have to, you can make up that um, you can start adding volume to compensate for uh, not for missing your planting deadline. So if you, you're you not able to get in in June 1, no big deal. You're looking at July 1. Well, then cool. I'm just going to tighten up my spacing on everything to three by three. And then you'll still be able to get the same yield. You're going to have to pay more in seed, but you're not going to lose out on the pounds that you would hopefully that you would have produced had you planted uh, a month earlier. So Going into uh, coordinating delivery with a nursery, so very important. We talked about this in the last session. We actually had a gal here who was from a nursery. Um, very important to coordinate with your nursery as far as delivery goes on your sprouts, um, if that's the way you're going. Um, we've had some issues in the past, last year specifically, like what farms will do is they'll say, okay, I am gonna plant on June 1, and they'll deliver all their seeds to the nursery, and the nursery is going to say, hey, well, your seeds are ready, but you're not ready. For some reason, your irrigation system didn't get set up. You had problems with the tractor. You weren't able to make your beds in time. And you say, well, I'm going to push those seeds off. I can't take them. Or I can't take my sprouts right now because I'm not ready for them. Um, what's going to end up happening is the nursery is going to deliver you. If say you're 10 days later, the nursery is going to deliver you plants that are now 10 to 12 inches tall. And while you think, great, those plants are big, they're healthy, they look awesome, they're all stretched out, and most likely what's going to happen is they're going to get damaged during the transplanting session, and you're going to probably lose a lot of plants. They're not going to be as healthy, they're not as going to be as robust. Um, the node spacing, which is the spacing between the branches, is going to be stretched out, and so what that means is you're going to have um, fewer auxiliary branches, so you're going to have less production points. So it's something to consider and just think about as you go through. If you can, um, you know, your, your nursery may say, hey, you got to take these plants um, because you know we just can't keep them here any longer uh, you may end up having to transplant them God hope you don't have to if you're doing large scale uh, transplant them into slightly bigger pots or to help kind of alleviate that again just just plan better on the on the onset maybe give yourself a little bit more of a window and a cushion um, so that you can have your plants ready um, you know maybe maybe you know, not quite at that deadline, or go with a, a, a larger cell size. So instead of doing like a T231, which is a really small um, cell for the root structure, go with a T144 or a 72 or a 96, something that's gonna give you a little more leeway if it is like your first or second year. Um, so that way, if you're trying to target that planting deadline and you can't hit it, you've got some, you've got some room for air there. So going through and, and going through on planting, um, like we talked about, you know, three-row transplanters, if you're doing by sprouts, is, is pretty much the most effective method. Um, you know, once you get them in the ground, you know, we're really concerned about um, transplant shock. So, you know, when you've got them, before you plant them, it's really important to hit them with probably like a fish emulsion, a vitamin B, and um, I always use like a three-in-one natural insecticide to make sure there aren't any uh, mites or aphids or any sort of bugs that got brought over from the, from the nursery. Um, so just making sure that uh, uh, that they're treated well and you don't have any transplant shock. We're trying to minimize that as much as possible. What? When do I do that? Yeah, so you want to make sure you do it like basically right when they get to your property. And you want to do, so what I usually recommend doing is two different uh, insecticides. Um, and again, they're all organic. I mean, I don't use any, I don't use uh, abamectin or Eagle 20 or anything like that. Um, but make sure you do like an overspray. And then you have to make sure you get underneath the leaves as well. So you need to spray from the bottom up, especially if you think you have mites, because mites will actually live on the undersides of the leaves. So it doesn't do you any good to do a, a foliar spray from above. I mean, you have to get them from underneath as well. So make sure if you're doing that, if you're spraying for mites, that that's what you're spraying. That's how you're spraying. Nothing systemic that's organic, no. No, so, yeah. No, if it's systemic, you don't want to put on, you don't want to put on your plan. It's not worth, it's not worth the risk. So, um, so we've talked about charging the beds, uh, talked about doing the B1, um, you know, going through and auto flowering. Um, if you guys do decide to do that, I definitely don't recommend 
um, doing those from sprouts. I recommend always doing auto flower just from seed. The reason being is once that tap root starts hitting the bottom of that cell, they will pretty much go into flower immediately. And so you have a very small window, usually only three or four days of transplant time with an auto flower um, before you run the risk of them actually flipping into flower early. And if you, I mean, if you flip into flower early with an auto flower plant, it's going to be like six inches tall. And you're, <laughs> so there's early, there's no, and there's no coming back from that. So um, if you're doing auto flower, it's something that you're consider. I highly recommend trying, you know, do a small parcel first and then doing direct seeding. That way you don't have that, that issue. Um, auto flower by its nature is incredibly unstable. Uh, and it's just, it's something more, it's more suited to a climate like California or Arizona where they can get multiple growing periods in a year. Whereas up here, you know, we're making up for what we're making up for in volume. We're trying to get in one shot. We're trying to do tons of, tons of weight at one harvest period, whereas they're getting, they're staggering their harvest throughout the entire year. So, you know, we have to play to our strengths in this environment, which again, typically is why most people don't go with an auto flowering strain here. Uh, if you are doing auto flower strains, um, you know, one by one spacing or two by two spacing is what you'd want to go with, something really tight, because these plants are only going to get 18 to 36 inches tall. Um, so you just want to make sure you pack in that field as much as possible if you're trying to do, if you're going to be doing that. So, um, all right, so we've got everything in the ground. We've got our beds charged, meaning, you know, we turn the water on for probably two or three days if we're doing a drip system prior to planting. So the beds are nice and wet. We've got everything in. We seeded them all. Everything's looking good so far. Um, so once we'll get to, so now, now we're looking at kind of watering and maintenance and making sure that everything's okay. So uh, that first, you know, week to two weeks, going to be looking at probably watering, at, if, if at all, maybe once. Um, if you overwater these things, they will get root rot. They will start to stall out. Um, it's like the worst thing you can do for them at that age, especially as they are already so prone to being going into transplant shock. You start soaking those roots; they're just they're going to starve. The oxygen is, isn't going to be able to enter the root zone, and they're going to they're just going to die out. So, be very careful about overwatering. Everyone always wants to overwater hemp. Um, it's it's just like cannabis. I mean, it loves to get dry between watering cycles. So that first two weeks, again, you're probably going to water at one time if you fully charged your beds. You're probably going to water once a week all the way through June. And then maybe come the beginning July, you may be looking at watering maybe twice a week. And even that, and that watering when you're doing once a week, you're probably only doing it for three or four hours at a time, um, depending on what your soil substrate is like. Um, there's some companies out there, uh, Pratum's one of them actually, they do soil moisture probes so they can kind of help you figure out like what your soil moisture levels are like, the depths at which your, your water table is at in your soil. So it, if you're kind of new to the, or you're leasing a field or it's a new field, you know, it may, may not be a bad idea to look at that, some of, some of those services to find out, you know, if you are or aren't watering too much. I mean, you can, you can tell the plants will just kind of yellow out a little bit. Um, that's a good indicator that you're, you're overwatering them. You had a question? I would dry down sometimes even to 50. I mean, I mean, yeah, it, it, and it, it, it depends on the age too of the plant. Like as they get older, I'm gonna dry, I'm, I'm gonna dry them down even low. As that tap root gets further and further down, I may dry them down even lower than that. Especially towards the end of harvest, if I can stress them a little bit, um, I can usually get those CBD numbers to spike right at the very end. So yeah, I mean, it's not something I would recommend. Like you know, someone doing it their first year, but yeah, I mean, the last year, uh, the last two weeks of harvest, I don't water. I mean, and they're, you know, they're, they're driving and, and you yeah, want to give them that stress. Um, so yeah, gradually increasing your water usage throughout the season. Uh, like I said, a well draining sandy loam soil, which is what we're going to see in central Oregon. Um, they're going to take basically one to two gallons every, every two weeks, uh, but we're about 8,000 gallons an acre. Um, and I always like to have them on a consistent watering schedule. So in my last session, I, I developed a, a, a timeline. But you know, devise a schedule so you're always watering at the same time, like every day, and that way you're always checking it at the same time. So that way you just you, you're always comparing apples to apples, and you're you're going to give yourself a much more clear data set. So you know, I'm watering this zone at this time, this zone at this time, this zone at this time. Try not to change it up. Try and keep it always consistent and the same. And that way you'll be able to tell, too, like differences between your zones to see how they're performing based off of when you're watering to see if that's coming into play on any of your, on any of your fields. Uh, also, avoid watering at night. We, so we talked about this last session as well. Um, mice, voles, gophers, they're all nocturnal, and they will... Um, chew through your drip lines uh, under your, if you have plastic, they will just, they will ravage your drip lines at night because the water will be running through. They'll be attracted to the water soils. They can hear the noise. They're thirsty and they'll just chew holes in, in all of them. And you'll spend just countless hours. 
Uh, I mean, I think I was managing a 500 acre hemp farm last year for an Australian company. And I, I probably had 10 people every day um, working eight hours a day repairing drip tape leaks on 500 acres. And we probably spent $100,000 in labor just trying to fix water leaks all season long. And you, it was some, you just couldn't get ahead of it. I mean, it was like every single every single day there'd be a new leak. Um, so it's, it's a very frustrating process. Definitely recommend if you've got pests, uh, you try and get them out of your fields as soon as possible. This was a situation where you know they decided to throw 500 acres on us like the last month, so we didn't really have a chance to go in and do all the necessary field work and amendments and everything else that we would have liked to have done prior to alleviate that problem. Um, so it's something that unfortunately we're just we were dealt with. But if you have the opportunity, like do not water at night if you can, if you can help it. You know, some some people's irrigation systems, like the field that they're deciding to water, is is you know, it maxes out the capacity of the irrigation system. So they're kind of, they have, they're forced to, but if you can, you know, avoid that at all costs. Um, and then, uh, let's see. So now we're going to go to uh, talking about uh, fertilizer. So I'll have Anthony and uh, Bill from Pratham go up and, and talk us about fertilizer and plant health. And Thank you, Jason. So I'm Anthony Otter. I'm with Pratham Co-op. A um, little about myself. I'm from Central Oregon. Grew up there my whole life. Uh, went to college at Oregon State University in 2014. Studied agricultural science with an emphasis in crop science and horticulture. Um, interned with Pratham when I was in college and uh, started full time with them in 2018. I'm Bill Hubble with Pratham Co-op for the last couple of years. Uh, been in agriculture my whole life. Actually started off in Connecticut on a small dairy farm. Uh, been out in Oregon now 12, 13 years, I guess. Uh, not only work with Pratham and work with the growers and had a lot of fun with the hemp growers this year, but also have about 100 acres of hazelnuts in the Willamette Valley. <coughs> So th this last year, we worked with quite a few acres of hemp. Uh, I was able to help Jason out in uh, Central Oregon with his 500 acres that he was working with. Um, worked, with worked with a lot of new growers, and we had a lot of new questions come up that, uh, you know, some of them we weren't expecting, and we had to learn a lot really quick. But I think we were able to help a lot of the growers using our background and our knowledge to have uh, some very successful crops this year. So the first thing with uh, fertil fertility uh, determination, um, first thing you want to do is take a soil test. It's absolutely critical that you take a soil test. See what nutrients are in the soil already. See what you're going to need to add and look at the pH along with the soil characteristics that are there. So how do we feed the plant? I'm going to let Bill talk about this. And the, and the, an the answer really is any way you want. It's, it's been interesting working with a wide, varieties of gr wide variety of growers. There's some that want to grow organic. There's some that are more conventional minded. Some have the resources to be able to spoon feed with liquid. Some want to do more of a one shot deal up front. And there's enough products out there and enough flexibility with a lot of the different options for to have that conversation, figure out what kind of approach the customer grower might want to take, and be able to put a customized program together that fits not only what the plant needs, not only what the soil test results suggest is required, but also in a manner that the, the grower is comfortable with and their customers might be comfortable with. So. You know, you, you take a look, there's, uh, you, is, oh, I can see it here. You know, on soil applied, there's dry conventional products that you would see going on grass seed or sweet corn or anything else. Um, that's not a bad way to start pre-plant, just to reset the levels of nutrients in the soil. Um, and, and obviously you can continuously feed through drip with liquid. And both of those options are also available organically. So uh, you're gonna, it, it costs more money, but you can, you can use that same, same approach, whether it's organic or conventional. Sure. 
So how do we get these nutrients on the field? So I've put a few examples here of some of the equipment that we have available. Um, right here, this is an injection, injection pump. This is what's used to pump uh, liquid nutrients into an irrigation system through the drip or through a pivot. Um, here we have a John Deere sprayer. We use our John Deere sprayer to apply uh, pest control products that are on the approved list as, along with foliar uh, nutrient applications. And then here we have a dry spreader. This is what we use for our dry granular and compost applications. And then for spot treatment, small scale, you have your solo backpack sprayer, which works great. So. We don't do that. <laughs> we do not do that. <laughs> So this is just a quick setup of, of a fertigation system. Uh, a lot of education last year with doing this. Um, some, some irrigation set systems were set up quite well to be able to accept this. Jason's was one of them. Um, but there, there's some watch outs when you're doing this. Uh, one is running fertilizer in without getting the fertilizer into the center of the water stream because you'll just rot out any metal components that you have. You want to get and blend it in, in with the water so you don't have any corrosive activity going on uh, on the steel pipes. Backflow preventers are important so you don't contaminate your water source. And that's the kind of thing we could help work with growers on, on making sure it get done properly. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. My One of my main jobs this summer was going out and setting up injector pumps. I think I did about 20 of them, so. <laughs> so nutritional strategies, um, the front loading versus the spoon feeding. So front loading is applying nutrients pre-plant, um, loading the soil with the required nutrient needs in one application, and then there's spoon feeding, which is applying what the plant needs throughout the whole season, season using fertigation. How about both? So our strategy is a combination of both. Uh, we like to go out and take a soil test and then front load the, the soil with the basics, the NPK. We'll look at our pH, see if that needs to be adjusted, al along with the soil characteristics. We look at b base saturations, organic matter that's there. And then through the season, we will do spoon feedings as well. Um, this method, we can adjust nutrients rates and timing based on growth stage of the crop. Um, it's also much easier for us to correct nutrient deficiencies and monitor nutrient levels in the crop and adjusting the fertilizer applications. Um, one of the main issues that I saw this, this year was I'd go out to a field and you know people would plant and they wouldn't apply any pre-plant fertilizer and they would just go out and plant and their crops were lacking uh, for very deficient. So we were able to get these uh, injector pumps set up and pump nutrients through their irrigation system and turn the crop around. So creating a fertilizer fertilization plan, like I said, it all starts with a soil test. Um, we'll meet with the growers to under, under, uh, excuse me, understand their desired approach and their operation uh, capabilities. Um, we add the pre-plan amendments, adjust the pH, look soil characteristics. Um, we'll create a custom uh, transplant mix, vegetative mix, and flowering mix. Uh, we did this out in for Jason and his uh, operation in Powell Butte. And then uh, through the season, we also monitor and adjust if needed. So we do this through petiole sampling, um, either weekly or biweekly, kind of depending on the stage that the crop's in and where we're at in the season. It was me and a bunch of our interns out there this year running around all these hemp fields, pulling petiole samples and it was it was a lot of fun, but we were also we also learned a lot about it on our uh, fertilization strategies and applications. Um, it gave us data driven fertilization fertilizer applications. Um, we were able to indicate if we were over fertilizing, under fertilizing, and the nutrient uptake of the crop, um, and helped us make better decisions for the whole season. 
And here is a test uh, during the vegetative period. So we're pumping the nitrogen to it. We're still watching our P and K levels, but we're noticing here that our boron levels are low. So that's something we'd look at to adjust in maybe our next application. So pest management was something that uh, I, I think a lot of growers going into 2019 that we were working with didn't necessarily have a, a, a plan for. And being a new crop, the, the pest pressure also didn't seem that high. We, we think over time it's going to get higher as you grow the same crop over and over and over again. Um, I, I know I spent a lot of time last winter doing a lot of research about what products are available, what products are also effective and, and economical on a commercial scale to be able to make sure we had an inventory, we had our crop advisors trained on how to use and, and ready to go if, a, if, if an outbreak happened. Um, we, we're, we love Marone Biosciences. They're a great uh, partner of ours. Uh, they did a lot of training. They have very good products. And, but one thing you're going to hear over and over again with any of these um, more biopesticides or organic pesticides is you're, you're not going to put out a fire. If you, if you wait too long and you have a major outbreak, these products aren't strong enough to do what a carbaryl or a lanate or something else could do on another crop. So you want to stay ahead of it. And prevention is, is a lot easier to control than trying to cure anything with, the, with these class of products. But it's pretty easy to put a program together that uh, you can make sure you got a healthy crop with when you're all done. So a few other things uh, to consider that we saw this last year, which Jason, you touched on a lot of these already today. Uh, one of them was being water testing. Um, we went out to a few fields that their irrigation water was bad and you know really there was nothing we could do about it on our end. Um, residual pesticide testing, um, make sure there's nothing left behind from you know past years that could damage kill or even contaminate your crop. Um, planting date is a big one. Transplant size and shock, like Jason touched on earlier. Um, your irrigation, overwatering was a big issue we saw this last year, and uh, field layout. You, yeah. Bill, we'll have yeah. you speak a little more on that. Yeah, and it's something I kind of thought of sitting in one of the earlier sessions about liability, those whole conversation about contracts and everything. And I, I didn't think of it when we were putting this slide deck together, but I was probably on the phone 25 times last winter with our insurance company. So as an ag retailer, our crop advisors are insured that if they make a recommendation that goes south or they make an improper recommendation and you potentially have a crop claim, we can settle that crop claim because we're insured to be able to do that. With hemp being as new a crop as it is and not necessarily being legal or having all the rules written nationally, a lot of insurance companies wouldn't touch it. So our insurance company, Berkeley Agribusiness, in working with their, their folks last winter, um, Pratham was insured as, a, insured as we did our work on hemp just as much as it would have been if we were working on a string bean field. So that gave us a lot of comfort that, that we could engage and be good partners with you and be more aggressive with our not aggressive, but more insightful with advice than just being a retailer that is waiting at the door for Jason to come in and say, hey, I'd like some regalia. You know, we can be out in the field, we can make recommendations, we can have these meetings. So some just to be aware of that, that uh, know who you're working with and make, make sure that, they're, that they have your back, whether it's an insurance policy or anything else, and, because not everybody, not every insurance company treated hemp the same way. So, uh, uh, and it was funny, the argument, not the argument, but what won the debate with our insurance company was that based on the list of approved products that ODA had, if we're spraying those on hemp, 
As an insurance company, you have a lot more risk of us spraying something on the grass seed field right next to the hemp and having a drift on the hemp than you do us spraying regalia on hemp. And they're like, we didn't think about it like that. It's like, so that really turned the corner and put us in a great position. So here are our contact informations. If you guys have any uh, further questions, you can feel free to shoot us an email or a phone call, and we can answer questions at the end as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we're out of Central Oregon, uh, Madras, and then we have locations in the Salem and Millersburg as well. So. And we served a lot of people all over the state. Yeah. Yep. Correct. So, thank you, Jason, for letting us be here today. Right. Um, okay, so we kind of touched on fertilization there. Um, I'm just gonna leave this up here in case you guys need to go ahead and, and look at that. But um, now we're kind of just go on into plant health and inspection. And um, like what Anthony was saying, like I don't know if you guys know, like the petiole, like that's, they do come out and take like leaf tissue um, samples from the plants in field. Five minutes, okay, great. Um, so uh, going through, so now we, you know, let's assume we're in July and we haven't had a total crop failure. We haven't been uh, destroyed by pests or bugs or sicknesses or anything like that. Um, you know, we're looking at kind of getting into that flowering period. Plants are starting to get two feet tall, maybe three feet tall. Um, so definitely make sure that you're walking your fields every single week, walking every single row. You don't have to be inspecting every single plant with a microscope, but just kind of looking over. What you're looking at is if you're looking at an entire field of plants, you're looking for like one or two that maybe look like... Uh, they're not doing as well as everything else. You're looking for kind of a ground zero or a patient zero because typically when you see some sort of sickness or illness, that's where it's going to come from. It's going to hit one plant first and then it's going to kind of spread from there. So when you're when you're walking through your fields, you're not like focusing on any one plant. You're just kind of glassing over all of them, looking for one in particular that maybe looks bad. And then you would go and spot check that and maybe kind of around those areas. Um, if you guys are planting from clones, which I don't recommend if you're doing on a super large scale, um, be aware that that you are opening yourself up to total crop failure, right? Like they are all the exact same copy, the exact same plant. So if you have any sort of genetic deficiency or susceptibility to any sort of virus or bacteria or pest, um, each one of those plants in your field has that exact same susceptibility. That's why I highly recommend going with F1 seeds for your stock because you're going to get a lot more um, phenotypic variation. You're going to get a much hardier, more robust plant in general. You may have, you know, one or two, you know, if you had one phenotype that was susceptible to a particular illness and that illness hit your field, well, if you're doing F1 stock, you probably got eight to 16 phenos. So maybe you lose an eighth of your crop or a 16th of your crop. But if you had the clone and they were all susceptible, you would in, in all likelihood lose everything. Thing. So um, very important just to be aware of that if you're doing clone stock. It's great if you're doing it in a greenhouse where you can control the environment 100%, but um, outdoors I, I definitely do not recommend. Um, so, you know, obviously telltale signs would be browning, yellowing leaves, droopy plants, curled leaves. Um, those are very easily identifiable signals of plant health. We had some genetics last year <coughs> uh, where we had a lot of uh, variegation which is really beautiful in roses and tulips and other flowers. Um, I had a ton of people come out to the field because you'd get some variegation in these leaves where you'd get these kind of yellow ribbons, which it looked, they look pretty. Um, but everyone was always asking me like, what's wrong with those plants over there? What's, what's wrong with those ones? Like, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's just in that particular varietal, it was a kind of just a, a genetic um, abnormality. Um, the breeder is actually kind of breeding it out right now because they've had a lot of people asking them the same thing. So again, just it's, it's important to know like what is a sickness and what isn't a sickness. Take photos go online, um, you know, and kind of look and say like, okay, you know, this is what I have. Does it look like any of these things? And there's tons of resources online if you topped in like weed, you know, weed nutrient deficiencies or hemp nutrient deficiencies. Um, you know, there's about a dozen of them that stand out and they're all pretty obvious. And you could be able to tell very easily if you, what you have in your field is that. Um, you know, there are currently no fungicides, no pesticides, no herbicides. Um, so, you know, that, that, you just got to be very careful with what you with what you use and what you put on your stuff. You know, um, there's there's always a risk involved, especially if you're planting in an area where there's people planting other crops nearby, like blueberries or raspberries or strawberries in particular. Strawberries, I mean, they, they spray those things with everything under the sun. So just be aware if you're in an environment where there's other farmers nearby and they're spraying stuff. Um, just just be aware. Maybe go ask them what are you spraying, when are you spraying, and just just again, it's something to think about. Always have that in the back of your head. Um, 
Germinating in a clean environment will reduce the likelihood of pathogens. So going back to using a, a reputable nursery, um, they're going to have a clean facility and they're not going to have any issues with that. Uh, common insects to attack hemp crops include broad mites, russet mites we talked about, spider mites, aphids, white flies, thrips, ants, termites. Um, aphids, had a great experience my first year with aphids. Our plants were contaminated with them from the uh, uh, nursery in Colorado that we got them from. Got them in the field, and within you know three weeks we had an aphid infestation, and we ended up going that the ladybug route and like purchase and uh, two hundred thousand you know ladybugs from Arizona, brought them up, and I had my nieces and nephews just like throwing handfuls of, of ladybugs through the fields, just crawling all over everything. But they they worked great. I mean they they killed everything. They ate everything under the sun within about a week. There was not a single aphid left on any of those plants. So there are very effective you know. Um, uh, biological weapons that you can use at your disposal, especially if you're doing something on kind of a smaller scale. So definitely look into those. I was kind of, I always doubted it because coming from the indoor, the indoor arena, I was like, ah, we're not going to worry about like ladybugs. Those are lame. But uh, on the outdoor side, they worked great, and I will, I will forever recommend ladybugs for anyone doing kind of a smaller operation. Um, you know, common fungal pathogens include bud rot, botrytis, which you're really going to see typically more on the at the end, the tail end, especially if you're here in the Willamette Valley. Very high moisture content. Um, once those buds start getting really dense, they're going to trap in that moisture. We get so those low temperatures in the evening, and that's very easily seen. You'll get those leaves. You'll get those uh, the leaves right on the buds just start to curl inward a little bit before you ever start to notice it on the inside of the bud. But within the, within 24 hours, you'll start seeing rot. So it happens very quick, um, and there's really you know nothing you can do about that. I mean, you just got to get those plants get those plants in and cut down. Um, common outdoor pests, voles, moles, um, ground squirrels, sage rats, deer, elk. Uh, weeds can be a really big problem too, so definitely have yourself like an effective weed management strategy. Um, cultivating mechanically with a tractor between the rows is great, um, but you got to make sure you stay on top of it. We had a, a problem last year with our in our Powell Butte farm where uh, our cultivator, which is our, our weeder that went on the back of the tractor, um, it was a three row, but it wouldn't get uh, right up to the very edge of the plastic. And so we, uh, we had a lot of weeds that would start to grow down and then actually up under the plastic towards where the water was, and they would anchor themselves in there. So we'd have, um, you know, we'd get everything out of the row, but right along the edges of the plastics, we'd have, you know, weeds that were like three feet tall. And so we have to go in and hand hoe those. And uh, it's, it's just important to maintain your weed management strategy as soon as you start planting. So as soon as you start planting um, and get those in the ground and they're secured and they're out of transplant shock, I mean, if you got weeds that are an inch tall, two inches tall, I mean, start start cultivating those now. Trying to get those out of there now before those root systems really get down and they can anchor in deep. Because once they get down too far, it's going to be so much more difficult to try and get them out of the ground. You know, when they're really tiny, I mean, sometimes you can just disturbing the dirt a little bit will be enough to break that plant out and, and you know, a few couple hours in the sun and it's going to be dead. Um, hand weeding, again, it, it works, but it is very labor intensive. So just uh, be aware of that. Again, try and stay on top of those things. And that uh, wraps it up. Any questions? Yeah, head to the mic. Control or the pest you're talking about, like yeah. the voles and moles. Yeah, it destroyed our drip all last year, like you were talking about. We we're just down the road from you. And um, do the pellets work? Can you use the pellets? You can, yeah, pre, you can, pre season. Yeah, yeah, that's what we weren't sure about. They'll contaminate the soil. It's gotta be, I mean, you got to be careful what's in them. You know right. what I mean? Like, just make it depends on which kind you get, but just make sure. Um, you can uh, you can fog too. That works. For, that that can work well. All so right. you just got to be you know just just be aware of whatever chemical you're putting on on the ground and whatever you're putting it's in it. Just the worst nightmare. When, like yeah. you said, every I day. I like uh, every honestly day like I like that. I like burners. Like they make they make uh, torches that go on the back of your tractors. Yeah. They'll be like twenty feet long and they'll basically just like blow torches that like just scorch the earth. Um, those things are pretty badass too. So I just like looking at them. I mean, they're rad. I mean, they're, and if you got weeds, if you had weed problem too from the previous season, you've got seeds that are in the soil. It'll cook them so they won't germ next year. So it, it serves double duty. What's that? Oh yeah. It, yeah, it goes. It, it goes underground. It, it traces the holes as well. Yeah. Um, you'd mentioned um, cross spray. These guys mentioned it from neighboring farms. Yes. Um, do you have any recommendations other than trying to work with your neighbors? If you have neighbors that are just really not willing to work with you, do you have any recommendations for that? 
No, I mean if they're assholes, they're assholes, and there's nothing you can. Thanks. There's nothing yeah. like, and honestly, like, and they may they may look at you the say. same way. Like, they're probably just gonna look at you as a weed farmer. I mean, chances are, you know, and they would just say, "Well, we don't really give a shit." Like, it sucks. You know, ideally, you, you don't want to have a neighbor like that because you would love to be able to like pool resources and whatnot. Yeah. Um, the only thing that you could do is just ask. You know, hey, will you let me know when you're spraying? Um, and then that way you could just be aware of it and you, maybe you can take a look at the wind and you could just see like, Hey, am I, is there a chance I'm going to be at risk? Um, I'm going to ask Anthony real quick. Do you, any of your guys' leaf tissue sampling tests that will, can they pick up pesticides or anything like that? That may be in a plant. Um, yeah, I so. Okay. How if, early, how early can you catch that? Oh, okay. I mean, well, I, so, but any, like, if you want to, like, like, a lab, like, even, like, so any lab that's going to do a full panel test, you know, if you thought maybe your plant was at risk, like, right, maybe my neighbor sprayed, you could take some of, you can take that plant and you could, or you could go take it over to, like, a Rose City or a Green Leaf and yeah. ask them to do a full panel. Yeah. They know it now. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I another thing to prevent it, I guess. Preventative, if there yeah. are any other preventative ideas that you had. No, okay. unfortunately not. Okay, thank sorry. you. Yeah, the wind would be the only one. A pain point I had last year is trying to determine the nutritional baselines for hemp slash cannabis. I grow hazelnuts also, and that's well known. And the boron levels they're all they're all known. But hemp was so new. Where do you guys, where do both of you determine those baselines just to try and quantify and then match? Where where's that found that information? It's actually kind of an amalgam of both what the cannabis needs are and what typical fibrous hemp needs are. So it's actually kind of a blend of that. I mean, if you you know, that's it's all that's where it's coming from right now. So who's producing that information? That's a good question. Um, oh, okay, universities in Kentucky and Canada. Okay. Okay. Because there's so much bro science on <laughs> exactly this is what it needs and this is how you're supposed to do it. Just so many variations. It's just what are the true agronomic baselines yeah so it's, Kentucky, it, you're it's saying? probably going to be a, a few years i think probably till it's like a set standard but like even okay. now like the labs that does the soil analysis and these guys like now there there are and you can kind of see the range it may tighten up over time but yeah okay. we, we, we know enough of it now to know what that is okay great university? university of kentucky canada i mean there's some universities that are doing some research on it um all right bill We did a lot of work last winter trying to get our baseline set um, and be happy to talk to you about what those are. But if, if you, what I found when I was doing a lot of research is they don't always tell you what they're growing the hemp for. And if you're growing for fiber, you might put 240 pounds of nitrogen on. If you do that and you're going for oil, you're gonna have problems. So it was, it was a combination of a lot of stuff that, that we put together to give us a start next year and we're going to even be tweaking that with what we learned last year for next year. Yeah, I mean, it, nitrogen is important, too, because you get too much of that in your soil, and then it's going to delay your flowering time. So it's really important to not have too much nitrogen in. So, like, you, re, you want your plants to flower right at the very end of July, beginning of August. Too high of nitrogen is going to keep them in that veg state for another probably two, possibly three weeks. So it's going to push your it's going to push your harvest time back until the end of October, beginning of November. And for us, that's just way, that's way too late. So done. All right, wrap it up. If you guys have any questions, you can come see me afterwards. Talk to Anthony or Bill here.